Today we are going to talk about policy iteration methods. which is fundamentally different from value iteration. The idea in policy iteration is very simple. There is an actor and there is a critic. The goal of the actor is to do policy improvement The goal of the critic is to conduct policy evaluation. Okay? So there is a policy improvement phase within the algorithm and then there is a policy evaluation phase within the algorithm. So the actor sends mu k, a stationary policy to the critic and the critic sends back jk, which is an approximation to v of mu k. So v is the value. What was I using for the cost function? Was I using j or v for the expected cost function? J. j. So j of mu k as a, so it computes an approximate value uh, approximation of j of mu k and sends it to the actor. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so in this particular algorithm, you have two things that gets updated, the policy and the uh, value for of using that policy or the cost function associated with that policy. Whereas in the value iteration algorithm, we were just working with the value function itself. We weren't looking at the policy at all uh, until we reach the, uh, until we converge to V star. Okay, so I'm going to use the same set of notations. Uh, P, so J is an R, J is a function from S to R. So Tj, I've been using Tv, but J is the same. So I want to min over U and U summation Piju Ci U J plus alpha Vj. So I'm going to I'm going to consider discounted cost now, uh, but some of the ideas can be can be extended to the uh, stochastic shortest path problem as well. You don't need to write these expressions because you know what these are, but anyways, if you want to write it, Okay, I'm going to define a new po new operator mj, which is r, which is the set of mu, <coughs> such that mu i is the argument of summation p i j u. Okay, so the description is pretty long, but mu is the minimizing policy here, minimizing policy in Tj. 
this is the same as saying t mu j equals to t j. Oh, yeah. So I don't see too, too much difference between this algorithm and value iteration. So you, you calculate the arg minimum and then you substitute back and then calculate again and so on. Right. So there is not much difference. If you run policy iteration where policy evaluation is conducted only one time at only for one time step, then it's a value iteration algorithm. But if you run the policy evaluation for infinite time steps, then it becomes a policy iteration algorithm. So we'll get to it in a bit. Okay. Just wait for maybe 10, 15 more seconds. Okay. <laughs> the only other thing I want to add here is that this particular function, this mapping, will be denoted by a Q function called Q of i comma u. Okay. So of course, a Q function is computed with a j, but typically that j will change from one algorithm to another. But when I talk about Q function, that's this whole function, okay? And of course, I will interchangeably use mj and mq, depending upon what operator I'm, what thing I'm trying to do at the, in that particular algorithm. So, m will be used in with either rs or rs cross. So, q is a function from s cr s cross u to r, okay? And j is, of course, a function from s to r. <clears throat> okay, so these are the operators. So these two operators are something that you have seen before. Um, these two operators are something that I'm introducing for policy iteration algorithms because that will be useful. Okay, so now what are the different classes of policy iteration algorithm? So the most important algorithm is the usual policy iteration in which, oh, um, okay. So mu k is T, no, M of JK. So you start from mu naught, JK plus one equals to T mu K raised to infinity of JK. So start with mu naught. Oh, my mu and m look similar. I have to change this m to, this is this m. Okay, yeah. So here, mu is a set, Well, you can pick any element. You can pick any element from m of jk. Usually m of jk would be singleton. Okay, uh, because you have only finitely many policies, but the number of J functions you could have is uh, uncountably infinite. So usually you will have only one function. Sometimes you could have two functions, so you just pick one of them. Okay, so what's this algorithm doing? I start with a policy. I start with some J naught, okay, and then I evaluate what the value of that policy is. So this is exactly equal to j of 
mu k. And then I update my policy. I pick mu 1 equals to m j 1, OK? And then so on and so forth. OK, so the actor proposes a policy mu naught. It goes to the critic. The critic evaluates the policy. So compute jk, which is exactly equal to j of mu k or mu 0. And then the actor runs m of jk to produce the next policy mu k plus 1. OK, any questions? Now this, of course, can be written in multiple form. So this is summation p mu k raised to t, t equals 0 to infinity, alpha raised to t, and this is c mu k. OK, so this is another way of writing it. There is another way of writing it, which is 1 minus alpha p mu k inverse c mu k. So all of these are equivalent expressions. They are all equal expressions. <clears throat> OK. This is the vanilla policy iteration proposed, I think, back in 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s. And the convergence was proved around the same time where it was proposed. OK, any questions? Yeah. This one? So, so the in the value iteration algorithm, instead of infinity, you have one here. Okay, that's the only difference between value iteration and policy iteration. Is there any theoretical? Um, like, is, is there which method is like theoretically better? Oh, uh, okay. So in value iteration, you have to run the iteration for infinite amount of time for it to converge. In policy iteration, as long as you can do this operation in finite time, it will converge in finite number of operations, guaranteed. Because there are only finitely many policies. right? So the number of policies is number of mu is u raised to s. Okay, so there are finitely, so this is finite, this is finite, so there are finitely many policies. So policy iteration would converge in finite amount of time. Okay, so um, how can you do this in one shot? Well, you have this matrix inverse C mu k. You can compute it and you can do it in, I don't know, n raised to 6. It only takes n raised to 6 operations to sorry, n raised to three operations to invert a matrix and then do the multiplication. So very simple. Any other question? Okay, so now the second is modified policy iteration. So let me start with mu naught. jk plus 1 equals to t mu k raised to mk uh, jk and then mu k plus 1 equals to m jk plus 1. mu naught
I am trying to see whether the indices are correct or not. Okay, I hope these time indices are correct. So I start with mu naught and I evaluate the policy using an arbitrary j naught in order to get j1. Then I pick mu1, which is minimizes over j1. And then I again uh, evaluate the policy, get j2 and continue this operation. So this is correct. This is also correct. Yeah, I think this is correct. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, here, mk could be any natural number. So mk equals to 1 corresponds to value iteration. Or, and, and mk equals infinity corresponds to policy iteration. So it sits somewhere in the middle of value iteration and policy iteration. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. So with the flexible MK, does that change anything about the asymptotic running time of the modified policy iteration? Uh, is it no so in practice, it is seen that it's it has a better runtime in comparison to this. Okay. So running this for infinite amount of time means you have to wait for much longer mm -hmm. uh, for things to converge. Uh, on the other hand, so remember T mu k is a simple operation, okay? So what is T mu k? It's just a matrix multiplication. Let me write it, let me write it here. So T mu k, C mu k plus P mu k multiplied by J. So it's a matrix multiplication alpha, uh, plus some addition of a vector and continue doing this operation again and again. So that's a much easier operation than to run value iteration where you have to minimize after every time step. So it has a, so if you have a large state space, large number of action, then modified policy iteration would be strictly better than either policy iteration or value iteration in terms of runtime performance. Provable or is it yeah, provable. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Bertzikas gives some reference to so this book, Neurodynamic Programming. So it gives some reference to uh, some papers that talk about modified policy iteration. <clears throat> the third algorithm that I'm going to talk about is. lambda policy iteration and this will lead to an algorithm called td lambda in the future okay All right, so what's the idea there? So in the policy iteration, so in 1960s, the idea is once I have the policy, I really need to compute j mu k before I can go and update the policy, 
Okay. <coughs> then somebody said, look, you don't really need to compute the exact cost. Okay. You can just run it for some time and then up update the policy. You don't have to go all the way to infinity. Okay. That was the modified policy iteration idea. Now, what that means is this jk plus 1 is merely an approximation of j of mu k. Okay, it's not exactly equal to j of mu k. So in this case, jk plus 1 is an approximation of j of mu k. <coughs> so now, let's take this approximation idea one step further and discount the future approximations that I'm going to be making. Okay, so how do you do that? So in this case, again, mu k is computed the same way. Mu k plus 1 is m of j k. Uh, you know, my notes differ from that notation. That's because I've picked these algorithms from various sources. So let me try to be correct. So j k plus 1 is jk plus delta k. So how do you compute delta k? So I have mu k from mjk. I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to define d of i comma j, dk of i comma j. So dk depends on jk is given by This is known as temporal difference. And delta k is defined as follows. It's expected value of summation t equals 0 to infinity, alpha lambda raised to t, dk of i t, i t plus 1, given i 0 equals to, sorry, yeah, i 0 is given. This is delta k i 0. And then of course you stack all of these vectors to create delta k that you then add to j k. Yeah. Okay. Two questions. First, <coughs> first, where is lambda coming from? Um, do we just decide that for the name of the policy iteration you get that? So lambda is between 0 and 1. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. And then the temporal difference expression yeah. that looks like it's it's talking about the cost as we change between the yes. states. It's, uh, it's what are the alpha uh, jk of j minus. So this is the current cost for using the policy mu k. Mm -hmm. This is the future cost I'm going to accrue if jk was the true cost, true value function corresponding to mu k. And then this is the, uh, this is the error. So this is the cost you're going to incur minus jk of i, jk of i is your current estimate of what it's going to cost you if at state i you pick an action according to policy mu k. And alpha doesn't come into the subtraction because we only care about the future step. Yeah, so this is the total, so remember what's the, at the optimal point, v star, so if j was equal to v star,
if if j was equal to v star, which is the optimal value function, then c mu k or c mu star plus p mu star v star with an alpha equals to v star. Okay, so if you take the expectation of this difference, it will be equal to zero if j k was v star and mu k was mu star, the optimal policy. So if then this happens, and so the expected temporal difference will be equal to zero, and so delta k would be equal to zero. Okay. So this is the cost you will accrue, uh, or the estimate of the cost you're going to accrue uh, because of using policy mu k. This is the current estimate of the value of the current policy, and you want to update the value by adding an appropriate value, and that value is computed by a further discounting of the temporal differences and taking the expectation outside. So this is known as lambda policy iteration. It was, uh, so TD lambda was, uh, I think, proposed around early 90s, and the lambda policy iteration was then uh, formalized in one of uh, the paper with Bertsekas and his student. Uh, back in 93 or 92, and he calls it lambda policy iteration. And the asynchronous version of that, which we are going to talk about in the next class, is known as TD lambda. Now here is the problem, uh, not the problem, but uh, the idea. So this jk plus 1, again, is an approximation to j of mu k. So it's not the exact value, but it's an approximation. and the reason why you need to discount it further is when you are computing this expectation using Monte Carlo simulation, which we'll talk about in the next class. So Monte Carlo simulation is you generate these trajectories according to mu k. So you have a simulator, and you've used that, you've encoded the actor in that simulator to act according to mu k. You have generated these trajectories. You have accrued the cost, and now you want to uh, compute the value of delta k. And it turns out that when you have discounting, you can minimize the errors that you would accrue if you were doing a Monte Carlo simulation for a very long time. Okay, So it has something to do with, so the lambda policy iteration as such is not really a good algorithm, but it's a very good conceptual framework to then design the TD lambda algorithm, which is an asynchronous version of lambda policy iteration. Okay. Nowadays, TD lambda algorithm has received a lot of attention for continuous state space setting because you can do the same thing in continuous state spaces as well. Okay. So people are very interested in knowing finite time error guarantees with TD lambda algorithm with some sort of function approximator approximation. So we'll again talk about it perhaps a couple of months from now. OK, so if we look at this expression, there is a lot of things we could infer. So let me, let me write down or delve deeper into this particular expression. So delta k can be written as expected value of dk i0 i1 given i0 plus alpha lambda expected value of t equals to 0 to infinity alpha lambda raised to t i t i t plus 1 i t plus 2 given i 1 and then I have to take an outer expectation given i 0.
Okay, so this term here is exactly equal to delta k i one. So what we have is a recursion. Oh, sorry, this is delta k i zero. So what we have is a recursion called delta k i zero equals to d bar k i zero plus alpha lambda p mu k delta k. Uh, this whole thing is evaluated at i0. So this is a matrix, gets multiplied by a vector, and then you pick the i0th component of that particular vector. Okay, so what is this d bar k i0? I'm using this to uh, because we don't need to recalculate the earlier information? Right, I can do that, but I want to get it in the same form as the way I have defined delta k, okay? If I don't do that, then I'll have to take out alpha lambda outside, so in order to that, do that, I'll have to put t minus one here, and then of course these two will remain as t and t plus one. So it's just a easier way to see it because this is exactly equal to delta k i. It's in the same format as that. Okay, so is this uh, step clear? So this is just defining d bar k i zero, um, which is exactly equal to the first expression here. And the second expression is merely the expectation of delta k i one given i zero, which is given by this whole thing. This should be i one, right? There should be? Is it, this should be of i one, right? Or I, I this is i zero. So remember, this, this is the inner expectation is delta k i one. And then there is an outer expectation given i zero. Okay, so there are two, th this is an iterated expectation, okay? So there is outer expectation and then there is an inner expectation. And the inner expectation is equal to delta k i1. The outer expectation is expected value of delta k i1 given i0. Okay? All right, so I can write it in the vector form. So what is delta k? Delta k is jk plus one minus jk. So I'm writing it in the vector form. So I have jk plus one minus jk is equal to d bar k plus alpha lambda p mu k jk plus one minus jk. Okay.
it can further be shown that d bar k is equal to t mu k j k minus j k. Okay. So just take the expectation of this expression. So I see this minus jk term outside. And if I take the expectation with respect to j, this is exactly equal to t mu k of jk. Okay, is that, is that easy to see? So if I take the expectation with respect to j, which is exactly what uh, d bar k i0 is, then this term, if I take the expectation that's equal to t mu k of j k, and then the minus j k term appears here in this particular expression. Okay. So now I'm going to substitute that in here, rearrange the expression. What do I get? So I have Okay, this term can be written as alpha lambda t mu k j k plus 1 minus t mu k j k. So I'm adding and subtracting c mu k from this expression. It's the same. Are there any cancellations? So this minus JK cancels with this on this side. And then I have JK plus one equals to I want to get the there is something fishy. Oh, alpha is not there. Okay, that's the problem. There shouldn't be any alpha here. So, alpha gets absorbed in this operator T mu k. Okay, so now jk plus 1 can be written as t mu k jk minus lambda t mu k jk plus lambda t mu k jk plus 1. Oh, 
1 minus lambda So t mu k is an operator, so I have to put brackets everywhere. But now, yeah. Isn't that just saying though that jk plus one is a function of, of something including itself? That's a fixed point of the operator. Oh, okay. That's what I was getting at. Okay. So JK plus one is a fixed point of this big operator. How do you prove that there is a fixed point there? Contraction mapping theorem. So okay. So since lambda could be between 0 and 1, so if you pick a lambda between 0 and 1, so I'm not saying for lambda equals to 1, it's a contraction map. But between 0 and 1, it's a contraction map. And jk plus 1 is a fixed point of this whole operator. So this part is, of course, fixed. This is the only part that the operator operates upon. OK? So what was the case in the usual policy iteration? Let me erase this part. In usual, policy iteration jk plus 1 equals to t mu k infinity jk. So this is the fixed point of t mu k jk plus 1. Okay, So in the usual policy iteration algorithm, the number one uh, topic that we talked about, this was the case. So jk plus 1 was a fixed point of t mu k jk plus 1. In td lambda, or in lambda policy iteration, jk plus 1 is fixed point of 1 minus lambda t mu k jk plus lambda T mu k okay so that's the connection to policy iteration algorithm I'm going to pause here for questions Let's do a quick recap. So the first policy iteration algorithm said, once I have figured out a policy mu k, I need to run the t mu k operator infinite number of times so as to compute j of mu k. This is the same as j of mu k. Then in modified policy iteration, people said, well, we are only interested in an approximation of j mu k. So why do we run it for infinite time steps? Let's just do it for finite number of time steps. OK? And that gives you modified policy iteration. Now in lambda policy iteration, people said, well, uh, this t of mu k has a contraction coefficient of alpha. So it will converge in certain number of iteration. But this operator has a contraction coefficient of alpha lambda. So it's much lower than alpha. 
because lambda is somewhere between 0 and 1. So you can pick lambda equals 0 0.5 and therefore you re reduce the contraction coefficient of the operator. And you can run this iteration to compute jk plus 1 which is again an approximation of j mu k. So in this case jk plus 1 is, is an approximation to j mu k and of course if lambda was equal to 1 this is the usual policy iteration algorithm because this term goes away 1 minus lambda will be 0. This will be equal to 1. This is t mu k which is the same as t mu k here. So lambda equals to 1 is usual policy iteration. Where should I write it? Lambda equals to 1 implies usual policy iteration. Of course, uh, again, in this case, lambda equals to 0 would apply, would mean that it's a value iteration algorithm. Okay, so I haven't proved it formally, but it can also be proved that lambda equal to zero implies value iteration algorithm in the lambda policy iteration. So oh, the JK plus one being the fifth point of that contraction, does that mean we just start off with a, an additional arbitrary a J and run it through that mapping? Well, you always, almost always start with JK and then run the mapping. Okay. Yeah. So you can, no matter where you start with, let's say you start with some random generated vector. Since it's a contraction map, it has a unique fixed point. So it will, con con it will converse to that fixed point. But if you start from JK or somewhere close to JK, it will always be much faster because you will converge more quickly. Remember that JK plus one and JK will not be very far apart. Well, won't that just be doing one run of usual policy iteration and then multiple of others? Is because if, if we start out with uh, uh, JK, uh -huh. it's effectively as if lambda. Uh, so the first zero. step, yes, but the next step will be completely different. Uh, yes, that's what yeah. I'm getting at. Is yeah. we're, we're doing policy iteration multiple times as a subrun of a different type of policy iteration. Uh, no, you're not doing any policy iteration. So remember, this is a way to evaluate j of mu k. So remember in policy iteration you want to get an approximation to j of mu k. Mm -hmm. So this is just trying to compute j of mu, an approximation to j of mu k which will be the fixed point of this operator. Okay. So, uh, so I think, uh, so if I pick j k here for the first iteration, mm -hmm. then I get t mu k of j k. When I put j k for the second iteration, then this would be t mu k of t mu k of j k, but it gets multiplied by lambda and then it gets added by 1 minus lambda t mu k of j k. So it will be more like a geometric sum of t mu k j k rather than uh, so, okay, so let's, uh, why don't you do it offline and then we can talk about it, okay? It's, uh, not that difficult to see. Okay, so what we have done so far is we have defined the general case of policy iteration. We have showed how the policy iteration, the usual policy iteration work. The modified policy iteration again for different parameters would amount to a usual policy iteration versus a value iteration. Same thing with lambda policy iteration, it would amount to the exact policy iteration or a value iteration algorithm for different values of lambda. So these uh, algorithms, which is modified policy iteration, lambda policy iteration, they sit somewhere between value iteration, true value iteration algorithm, and true, true policy iteration algorithm. Okay. In the similar vein, I'm going to talk about another policy iteration algorithm, which is enhanced policy iteration. So I'm going to erase everything now. So any questions so far on what's on the board? Yeah. Yes, um, but you, at every step you have to do minimization. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so if we pick somewhere between zero and one, we still need to solve this, this equation, this. Um, but all of this, all of this is matrix multiplication and addition. There is no minimization being performed here. 
remember what is t mu of j t mu of j is c mu plus alpha p mu j there is no minimization here if that's a way can we move this to the left hand side solve the linear yes you can yeah you can always do that right any other question yes this one yeah so this is because so remember this is an operator that's running infinite number of times so let me replace this operator and say this is t mu k t mu k infinity minus 1 of j k right what is this equal to j k plus 1 because infinity minus 1 is still infinity right so it's still equal to j k plus 1 so therefore that's a fixed point of t mu k any other question <coughs> yes So these algorithms are developed, remember, so the basis for these algorithms is to be able to do it using simulations. So we haven't yet gone to the simulations part, which we will do from the next, next uh, class. Uh, so right now we are studying the deterministic version of the algorithms that will all translate into simulations in, a, in the next class, okay? So in the simulation, these algorithms will have desirable properties which will make them amenable to implementation for very large state space and large action spaces problem. Okay. Uh, this was the third one, so the fourth one is enhanced policy iteration. Okay, so this again I have to introduce quite a few notations for this. Uh, this algorithm is not very old, so this was proposed by Bertsekers and you in 2012, so less than seven years ago. But it's, it's an absolutely beautiful paper to read, so I, I highly recommend you to read this paper and perhaps write, write papers that follow the same. Uh, it, it's really a very beautiful paper to read, okay? So um, hopefully all of us can learn something about writing papers by reading this paper. Okay. <clears throat> So what's the idea in enhanced policy iteration? So what's the motivation for, uh, for coming up with a different class of policy iteration algorithms? Well, if you look at the asynchronous version of these algorithms, which we'll, we will study in the next class, uh, there are some convergence problems. So there are counter examples available in the literature and it'll come in your assignment too where asynchronous policy iteration would fail to converge if you start from an arbitrary initial condition. So this algorithm was conceived by the authors to get around that difficulty that your algorithm should not be sensitive to the initial condition you pick. So the initial J0 you pick or initial mu naught you pick, your algorithm shouldn't be sensitive uh, and it shouldn't be the case that your algorithm fails to convert just because you've picked the wrong initial condition to begin with, okay? So it's a very frustrating experience because if you are the graduate student running that algorithm and just because you picked the wrong initial condition and your algorithm doesn't convert, then it's a, it's a disappointment because you wouldn't know why it's not converging, okay? So that's why they came up with this algorithm. So we'll, we'll again study the deterministic version of the algorithm today and go to the asynchronous version in the next class. 
Okay. So I'm going to define an operator f j nu. So what is j and nu? So pick nu is a policy. Can be any policy. Can be randomized policy as well. <clears throat> j is a vector in Rs, or j is a function from S to R. You can think of it anyway. And then you define f mu, sorry, f j comma nu as an operator from R s cross A to R s cross A. So it, it runs, uh, so it, it maps a q function to a q function. And it's given by Oh, uh, I think there is a min, oh, there is no min, no, there is no min. Oh, this is evaluated at i, i comma u. plus alpha summation u prime nu u prime given j Okay. This, this new, new is a policy. You can pick any policy, random. Uh, no, not random. Random is already used. Arbitrary. So you can pick an arbitrary policy new, OK? Yeah, so this is uh, action given the current state, OK? Uh, J, J is the next state. J is the next state, OK? OK, so uh, it's a very non-trivial algorithm, OK? So you pick any policy, pick any vector j. You have a mapping from q function to q function. So what is fj nu of q at i u equal to? Well, it's the expected cost. Plus, in the future, you have a policy nu that you use to act, and then instead of using the usual q function or the value function, you do a minimum of j comma q. OK? So that's the idea in this policy. So what is the step that's related to policy update? What is the policy update? Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. There is no policy update here. Uh, 
it turns out that this iteration would converse to would converse to q star comma j star and i'll get to it in a bit okay um, so so Bertzikas calls it enhanced policy iteration because it has some properties of policy iteration, but there is no strict policy improvement phase and policy update phase in this one. Okay, so it doesn't fall within the usual framework of policy iteration method, but he calls it enhanced policy iteration for some reason. He might have as well called it enhanced Q value iteration or something, and it would still work. But he calls it a policy iteration. Maybe I should ask him why he calls it policy iteration. Yes. 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 So this is the value function. This is the q function at u prime. This is comma. So this is minimum of two numbers. So q j comma u prime is a number. J j is a number, and you are taking the minimum of two numbers. This is new, which is the policy you picked u prime given j u prime is the action you would take in the future no this is oh so new is a randomized policy so new of u prime given j is the probability that u prime will be taken when you are at action when when you are at state j okay so that's that's what this notation means it's a randomized policy, OK? So randomization would allow you to explore um, in, in some of the RL algorithms. So we are not going into that yet. Just the deterministic analysis. So what do we know about it? So what we know, easy to prove. So f j, so. I haven't talked about what's the optimal Q star. So let me talk about Q star. Q star IU would satisfy summation PIJU. C I U J plus alpha min U prime Q of J comma U prime. Okay, so this is, sorry, Q star. So Q star is a fixed point of this ex expression. So there is a min over U prime of Q star uh, of J comma U prime. Let J star I equals to min Q star I U, U and U. Then, f of j star comma nu of q star equals to q star. <clears throat> the nu doesn't matter, okay? So nu does not affect the uh, new does not affect the fixed point. OK, so it doesn't matter what randomized policy you start with. It doesn't affect the fixed point of this operator. Third is f j1 nu q1 minus f j2 nu q2 take the infinity norm is less than or equal to alpha max j1 minus j2 infinity, q1 minus q2 infinity.
Yes. So min of over u prime of q star of j comma u prime. So q is a matrix. You look at the so the rows are indexed by j, columns are indexed by u prime. So you look at the minimum element in each row, and that becomes this vector. Okay. All right. Yes. So the three winds up being some form of augmented contraction. Yes. Almost as if if J, J and Q were augmented together. Right. Okay. Yes, that's exactly how the proof would go. Okay. We are not going to do the proof in the class, but that's exactly the line of thought in the proof in the paper. Okay. So alpha is the contraction coefficient here. And these are all infinity norms. So there are two types of algorithms. So there are two things to update. So you start with an arbitrary j. So what, what all things you start with? You start with an arbitrary nu. You start with an arbitrary j. And you start with an arbitrary q function. And then you run some algorithm. So we are going to talk about those algorithms right now. You can update the policy nu according to the policy iteration method, or you can pick any other policy that you like. Okay, you don't necessarily have to um, uh, pick nu according to a specific fashion. It's not required for the algorithm to work. It will work regardless. However, jk and qk has to be updated in a very specific fashion. So let's talk about it. So two types. So this is for A, my QK plus 1 is equal to F JK nu raised to MK QK and my JK plus 1 is min over U and U of Q, well, jk plus 1 i, i comma u. Is that qk? Sorry? Is that qk? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is qk plus 1. Good question. That's qk plus 1. So I'm, I'm going to call it sequential update. So I first update qk plus 1, and then I update jk plus 1, Okay, starting from a jk and qk. Um, there is another one for b, which is parallel update. So as the name suggests, jk plus 1 i equals to min i min u in u. QK I U. So I can update JK plus 1 independently from QK plus 1, which is equal to F JK nu QK. Okay. Now, you know, if you go to the literature, I don't think this paper has been cited a lot of times, maybe 48, 50, maybe 100 citations. So it looks like there is a lot you can do with this algorithm that hasn't been discovered yet. Okay, so that's why I'm covering this algorithm in the class because it's pretty new and perhaps has not been exploited to the full extent. So what are the properties? Yeah, sorry. So with in 4A, the fact that uh, we can pick any MK for the proofs of it working, we're just going to assume that MK would be 1 then, even though it should yes. converge faster with a higher order? Yes, so again, in this case also, if you put MK between 1 and infinity, it will have a better convergence. Like, it will converge to the optimal solution quickly. In 
would be, it almost looks like there's an oscillatory passing of information because they're out of phase. Does that come into practice at all, or is it something that with the parallel updates for this function, maybe it doesn't matter? Uh, I, I didn't quite get your first part of the question. Because so. uh, so JK plus one is updating based on QK. Correct. And QK plus one is updating based on JK. Right. Okay, they're, they're oscillatory in a certain fashion, that they're both being updated off of the previous state of the other. Uh, and so, it, so I'll tell you how it affects the algorithm. Okay, so this, let's say this operator is denoted by G. So G as a function from JK, QK to JK plus one, QK plus one. Okay, so this G is now acting on the space of RS cross RS cross U. Um, is a contraction under soup norm, under infinity norm. So the norm is max of J, inf J infinity and Q infinity. And the contraction coefficient is alpha. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that this is alpha raised to mk, but the paper doesn't say specifically what the contraction coefficient is. So this is something you, you may want to check. Uh, I, I personally believe based upon my reading that it is alpha raised to mk because you're running this contraction operator mk times. Okay, but I may be uh, slightly wrong here with respect to the contraction coefficient. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the sequential update scheme. Let me call this uh, update scheme with operator L which maps jk qk to jk plus one, qk plus one. So this is the operator for the parallel update scheme. And this operator is also a contraction, but with respect to a different norm. So the norm is square root alpha max of j infinity over square root alpha norm of q infinity and the contraction coefficient here is square root of alpha Okay, so once again, the norm you pick is important because it tells you something about in which space is the contraction or under which norm is there a contraction and operator is a contraction. If you had picked any other norm, so let me tell you a story. We were trying to design an algorithm of this type and we were using J infinity, Q infinity norm. I hadn't read this paper until then and um, I wasn't able to prove that it's a contraction, okay? Okay, <laughs> I wasn't able to prove that it's a contraction. And after some research and uh, thinking about the problem, I came across this paper, and then suddenly I realized where I was going wrong. The norm that I had picked was incorrect. I should have picked this norm. And then it, I would have shown that that is a contraction. So that's why picking a norm is very important for whatever reason. They were able to pick this uh, norm in 2012 and I wasn't able to think about it in 2020. So it's important, okay, norm is important. But anyways, 
So depending upon the parallel update versus sequential update, you have different contraction coefficient under different norms, but they both are contraction and therefore they would converge to the unique fixed point, which is J star Q star, okay? All right. Now, the important thing again, doesn't matter what new you pick, okay? Another thing, mk equals to one, new would be picked according to some specific fashion, then it's a value iteration algorithm. If you pick mk equals to infinity, new according to some other fashion, it becomes a policy iteration algorithm, and so on and so forth. So you can, you can uh, uncover, no, not uncover, you can recover, sorry, <laughs> not uncover, you can recover the usual policy iteration algorithm, value iteration algorithm, uh, modified policy iteration algorithm, all using uh, various choices of MK and new in this uh, problem. Okay, so that's the connection. Uh, with that, I end this class. So next class, so until now, we have done all deterministic algorithms. This paves way for all the reinforcement learning algorithms. So we'll talk about asynchronous algorithms and then move into more sophisticated reinforcement learning algorithms as time progresses, okay? So see you in the next class.